So thank you all for coming. Um, as I was explaining earlier, just before the talk, this is a new talk, so no one has ever heard this talk before, which is, I think you should find that very exciting, but you should also expect some rough edges. Um, so I apologize in advance if anything seems out of, uh, oops, I just, oh no, it is still recording. Okay, good. Um, so I know that uh, Georgetown has a reputation for being a place where people come to make a grand future for themselves. Uh, it's a university for doers. Um, and in fact, I say that about Georgetown's reputation, but in fact, it's what most of our, us have become uh, these days. Most universities, most of the college campuses where I speak, even to some extent, the very strange liberal arts college where I teach has is infected by this sense of grandeur of launching oneself out onto a world where we do things. Um, the world of impact, results, making a difference, um, uh, grand affairs. Um, but part of, part of the Catholic faith uh, is to think that um, all of these things, uh, politics, international affairs, uh, the world of doing in general, impact, results, uh, making a difference, all of that in our faith is something secondary. It's not to say that you can't pursue these things. We can live, uh, pursue our grand futures and make impact. After all, it's important to do that. But uh, we have to remember all the while that we live on a kind of pilgrimage in the world uh, that it cannot ultimately be perfected and that our highest hopes lie in God alone. So that's part of the spirit of this talk, even though it's going to be mostly about some beautiful paintings and um, Mary and the Church Fathers. So one route that we might remind ourselves as Catholics of the reality of the purpose of our lives, that is that our, the realm of uh, accomplishment, achievement is secondary. The most important route is prayer, liturgy, but I want to talk tonight about a different way, uh, uh, something to do in addition, not an alternative exactly, but something different. Uh, and that's the route of study for its own sake. Um, and I want to talk about how we imagine this type of study, how we imagine our lives as informed by studying, how we imagine the use of our minds. We will, of course, also be thinking about study, what it is, why it matters, why the use of our mind matters. But I think that our imaginations actually shape more about what we do, uh, how we, our images of ourselves are more fundamental to, our, to how we act than uh, any particular piece of thinking. Um, so um, I began with a, I should have actually put this up first. Um, so that's the New York Times editorial board. So that's, that's uh, these people are it's a group of thinkers who make an impact in the world, at least in their own estimation. Okay. Consider this painting. That's, so that might be an image that we have of ourselves that drives. And it may affect us un even unconsciously. We can make fun of the you know, Times editorial board and still find ourselves drawn in by that image of what it means to be successful, or what it means to be important. So consider also this image. This is. Uh, Raphael's extremely famous fresco of the School of Athens. Um, it features celebrity intellectuals, so there's uh, Plato and Aristotle famously talking to each other, a variety of other characters from ancient Greek philosophy in the scene. Uh, it's uh, grand. Uh, our intellectuals are gathered in a sort of heavenly court. Uh, it represents, the, in some way, allegorically, the airy realm of their imagined conversations the royal community, a gathering of the great. Uh, so it's not surprising that this image adorns the dorm rooms of certain types of students, um, those who seek to achieve in the realm of the intellect, to join the pantheon of the truly nerdy. Uh, but I want to talk about a different kind of image. And in fact, uh, although not as famous now, uh, more prevalent, uh, in European art of Middle Ages and Renaissance. And that art is, uh, sorry, it is good. Oh, don't be. Um, I don't think I have a clicker, so, oh, I could do this though, that would be faster. Um, 
So this image is uh, of a teenage girl, as I say, who loved reading. And the most common scene in which Mary is pictured with a book is at the Annunciation, as pictured here. Um, and this is the depiction of the scene in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, where the angel Gabriel greets Mary and tells her that she will become the mother of the Messiah. After a bit of struggle and conversation, she answers, be it done to me according to thy word. So why, we'll talk more about the scene and its significance and why it's portrayed in a particular way further on in the talk, but for now start with this kind of apparently trivial question, why is she holding a book at this particular moment? Um, sometimes she's actually surrounded by books. So here you can see one, two, three, four, five books. Um, here she's clearly engaged in a serious study project. There's a massive number of books over here. Uh, so the question of why there were books is actually the original personal question that drove the research behind this talk. Um, and I, for a trivial personal reason, I inherited a statue of uh, a saint holding a book for my grandmother, and I wanted to find out. I, she was an atheist, and I'm a convert, so I had no idea who this person was. I wanted to find out. At some point, I figured out it was Mary holding a book, and I wanted to know why. So I went down a rabbit hole on a procrast when I was procrastinating doing something else, and I came up with what I learned, most of which I'll share with, share with you tonight. So Mary's book doesn't only appear in images of the Annunciation. Uh, it also appears in the image of Mary as Queen of Heaven. This is Van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. Uh, it's been stolen 13 times, uh, and you can see why. It's extraordinarily beautiful. Um, or in this image where Mary reads in the Garden of Paradise, surrounded by other saints, engaged in sort of the culminating leisure activities of a human life, playing music, uh, eating fruit, having conversations. Um, and then uh, we also have a, a type, so there's a number of versions of this image, this is the one I could find, of uh, Saint Anne, Mary's mother, teaching Mary how to read. Um, and uh, the book turns up in other contexts. So this is Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch. Uh, Mary's babysitting uh, John the Baptist over here. He's still wearing, he's wearing camel hair even as a two-year-old. Uh, and um, she's reading a book even here, even when the central image is this uh, gold finch representing the crucifixion, which the two children are sharing. Um, so uh, it helps us to focus our thinking about the meaning of this image if we stick with the Annunciation for a time. That image is the most pervasive. That's where she almost always has a book in Western painting. Uh, in the Eastern painting, she has a spindle for spinning for a different reason, but in the Western painting, she has a book or books. Um, and it has the longest history also. So most of the paintings we'll be looking at are from the 14th to 18th centuries. Uh, uh, the art historians tell me that there are images going back as early as the 9th century. Um, the oldest images I have are the, uh, the 13th. This is the outside of the cathedral at Chartres. And you can see this is Mary and the angel, and there's a book at their feet. Uh, and I've wondered about this. I wonder whether the book is uh, describing what's happening or whether it's uh, a book that has fallen from Mary's hands. Uh, we'll never know, but it's, a, it's one of the older of the images. And this one's, oops, wait, that's not the right one, that one. Uh, this is the 11th century enamel. And this has all of the crucial things that we want. So there's an angel, there's Mary, there's a book on a stand. There's the, the greeting uh, that Gabriel's giving her, Ave Maria, Hail Mary. And then um, he's zapping a ray into her ear. It looks like her eyes, but it's her ear. Um, and that ray is extremely interesting. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about that and looking at it more closely. So sometimes uh, the ray comes separately, but simultaneously. So here it's a little hard to see. You can see through the window, there's a homunculus Christ holding a cross, infant Christ holding a cross, who's traveling down towards Mary behind the angel. So it's, the angel is not always the agent of this particular ray. This is also interesting. This is the Marode altarpiece. Um, it's in the Metropolitan New York. 
She's, there are signs of Jewish study here, so it's clearly the Torah that she's reading. This is a Torah cloth, and that's a Jewish prayer shawl in the back of the room. Uh, so anyway, it's in the extinguished candle, uh, and there's two books, so she's reading maybe the Torah and the prophets, I'm not sure. Um, but at any rate, the ray is also interesting, the homunculus. Um, and in this one, we see it's a little hard to see on the slide, but God the Father is present, and the ray is coming down towards her ear as the angel speaks to her. Um, and uh, some t- it's, so this ray is the image of the conception of Christ that takes place during the Annunciation. Uh, it's the conception by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit d- descends upon her and she conceives. And so here you have just a dove and everything else has disappeared. This is a sort of later and more naturalized <coughs> image. So there's no angel, there's the book, and there's the dove. Um, and uh, you can imagine that this is depicting, even in a certain, so a certain sort of way, an inner experience of Mary's. Um, or this one where there's, I think, no ray, just book. Uh, very, very naturalized. This is Mary reading a book, and there's a lily of chastity. Um, so, uh, OK. So these are peaceful images of Mary conceiving as she reads, and they lie in sharp contrast with images that show the Annunciation to be an interruption. So this is one of my favorites because um, she really looks like a cranky teenage bookworm that's just been interrupted, right? Uh, the angels come up to her and she's like, what the, what do you, I was reading, what do you want? Okay, uh, but here the words of the angel are the ray directed at her ear, but you can see her pulling, she's pulling back from the words of the angel. Uh, now these later ones, these are 16th century, this is, I think, Titian. There's Titian and Tintoretto. Yes, I think the first one is Titian. Uh, this is extremely violent, so you have the sense that some major interruption has taken place in Mary's life. Uh, the skies have opened, there's a number of heavenly beings, the, she looks uh, um, unsettled by the angel's appearance, and same with um, the Tintoretto, the angel's coming through the wall. Um, she looks uh, unsettled and alarmed, flushed a little bit. Uh, so so th- these images, as you could imagine, with their violence, that they're depicting something like the disturbance that it might have caused Mary to have an angel arrive and tell you that you're going to bear a child. Uh, after all, she does say, how can this be in the gospel? So there is, and she's, she's deeply troubled when the angel first talks to her. So one might think that that's what these images are depicting. However, I actually want to object uh, in a certain way to the violence of these images and go back and think about why the more common paintings are scenes of peace, calm, naturalness, and so on. So in this one, there's a sort of pleasant seeming conversation between the angel and Mary. She keeps on doing what she's doing. So uh, let's talk about why that matters. Um, So most of the paintings and the written tradition which undergirds them, which goes back to the fathers, we'll talk about in a minute, they reflect an image of Mary who's calm, reflective, wise, and maybe even expectant of God's message to her. So in keeping with uh, Luke's repeated remark, if you remember in the Gospels, that Mary keeps things and ponders them in her heart, That seems to be the spirit which guides most of these paintings, most of these images, and their peaceful contemplative flavor, what you might call the nonviolent flavor, for lack of a better word. So sometimes uh, the angel doesn't even seem to, I wonder if I have a good image like this. Yes, I do. This is an image where the angel doesn't even seem to touch her awareness. He's at the other side of the wall. Um, She's uh, in communion with her book, or with her prayers. Um, And that is what seems to be what the Annunciation, the message from the angel, and the conception seem to consist in. It's something that grows immediately out of her contemplation of the scriptures, her contemplation of um, the promises of God. And somehow in that moment, this event happens, this extraordinary event in salvation history. Now, um, let's look more closely Um, at the ray that enters her ear. Um, It's the Holy Spirit, as I said, 
that enlightens her mind. However, in some of our images, we also saw it was the words of the angel itself. We would go back to Simone Martini. Do I have that again? Oh, yes. So uh, it's the, whole, the dove and the Holy Spirit. And then you also have a baby in a homunculus, Christ holding a cross, heading down her, towards her ear. But then the words of the angel are also going into her ear. Um, here it's the words of the angel again going into her ear. Um, and here you have uh, this hilarious uh, tube. This is on the outside of the cathedral of Marian Kapel in Würzburg in Germany. Uh, tube going from the mouth of God the Father down into Mary's ear. Uh, very, very famous and hilarious image. So uh, what is the point of the emphasis on words going into her ear? Uh, it's the words of the angel, the words of the scripture, the speech of God um, being heard by her. Okay. So Paul, in the letter to the Romans, in chapter 10, says famously that faith comes through what is heard and what is heard through the word of Christ. So these words that are going to her ear are not ordinary words, and Mary's encounter with them is not an ordinary encounter but the means by which she conceives the word of God, uh, the means by which she becomes the mother of Jesus. This is sometimes described somewhat technically as we do in the Catholic Church. We always have cute Latin tags for everything. Conceptio per aurum, conception through the ear. And this is its most graphic uh, depiction, as I said, the most hilarious one. So this is actually sometimes found if you, if you uh, get deep enough into it. Um, it can be the subject of some mockery of Catholics for believing such a thing. Uh, it, seems to, it might seem to be a sort of elaborate way of explaining something mysterious. That she, you know, she, how did she get pregnant? Well, it had to come in somewhere. Well, maybe through the ears. Um, but I think that the mockery doesn't actually make much sense when you think about the fact that she conceives through the words of God. That is, she conceives through hearing the word of God and through her faith. And when you th it's kind of a straightforward fact that you may not often think about, but words do actually have to be heard through your ears. So there is a physical embodied element to our hearing words, including the words of God. Uh, so what's emphasized is her hearing, her understanding, um, and her experience of God in this moment as something, for lack of a better word, um, into having a significant intellectual component. Okay? She hears words, understands them, takes them to heart. Um, and it's this process that's the Annunciation. And this is a moment in which Mary becomes our model in faith. So St. Augustine writes very beautifully about this. Uh, and I'll read you some of his things because he says it better than I could. So the angel announces, this is Augustine, the virgin hears, believes, conceives faith in her mind, Christ in her womb. Okay, so it's a common theme in Augustine's sermons. Mary conceives Jesus by faith, not by lust, not by the body, not by the flesh, um, not through trying to attain something selfishly, but through receiving God's word. He compares Augustine, God's action on an ordinary believer. When you, that is you and I, believe in, our, in the heart unto justice, you conceive Christ, and when with the lips you confess unto salvation, you give birth to Christ. Uh, Augustine also writes more of the significance of her hearing, um, hearing the word. Uh, he says the following in a different sermon. While the Lord is passing by, performing divine miracles, with the crowds following him, a woman said, fortunate is the womb that bore you. And how did the Lord answer to show that good fortune is not merely to be sought in family ties? Rather, blessed are those who keep, hear the word of God and keep it. So that is why Mary, too, is blessed, because she heard the word of God and kept it. He kept the, she kept the truth safe in her mind, even better than she kept flesh safe in her womb. Christ is truth. Christ is flesh. Christ as truth was in Mary's mind. Christ as flesh in Mary's womb. That which is in the mind is greater than what is carried in the womb. Now, Augustine might be a little bit off on the, incarnate, the importance of incarnation here, but his, he's emphasizing something which is unexpected. That is, the importance of Mary's mind and heart 
uh, in her role as the mother of Jesus, which is, which is really what these images, um, I better take this silly one out of the screen, um, uh, are meant to communicate to us. So, sometimes, so uh, Ephraim, who's one of the Syriac fathers, also shows Mary at this moment to be a model um, of believers um, who receive, who we, like her, receive the word through our ears. Um, so he writes, Mary, the thirsty land in Nazareth, conceived our Lord by her ear. Okay, so you too, a woman, this is the woman at the well in the gospel, conceived the son by your hearing. Mary planted him in the manger, but you planted him in the ears of his hearers. So sometimes um, the fathers contrast Mary's ear, which is receptive to the word of God, with, uh, e the wor with Eve's ear, which was receptive to the deceptive words of the devil in the garden. Uh, so Mary as the new Eve also has this theme. So in this, this is Fra Angelico. Uh, the Mary is receiving the word from the angel, and you see on the other side Adam and Eve uh, in the garden, so making the comparison clear between Mary and Eve. M Eve who receives the deceiving words of the serpent, Mary who receives the word. Um, so it's Mary's intellectual virtues, her understanding, her wisdom, which undo Eve's intellectual vices, susceptibility to deception, and doubt of the word of God. So we have... Um, a number of passages from the fathers. This is Ephraim again. Just as from the small womb of Eve's ear, death entered in and was poured out. So through a new ear that was married, life entered in and was poured out. Uh, I think we can skip that one. Okay, so Mary's hearing of the word, conceiving in faith, is part of the peace and the naturalness and the nonviolence of the scenes that is, they, um, these themes circle around the theme of her consent, right? her consent being the central part of the Annunciation, her agreement um, to bear the son, of, uh, the son of God, and a consent that's not just um, ignorant or frightened, but one that's informed by understanding. Uh, and the, the more you, if you think about it, the more you understand, the more your consent matters, right? Uh, if if you um, uh, if you marry someone you've known for a week uh, and you say I do, your consent means something different than someone who you've known for quite a long time. Your understanding changes the meaning of your consent, gives your gives depth and richness to your consent. Um, so th I think that that's part of the reason why um, the books are so significant to the fathers um, and to the painters. So uh, the, the church, so understanding um, is the key virtue that uh, the fathers and the painters are seeking to find in Mary. So the church father Origen, who's probably the earliest source of this aspect of Mary, the idea that she was a, a learned person, a person who liked to read. Um, he wrote that she knew the law, that was the Torah, she was holy, and she had learned the writings of the prophets by meditating on them daily. So she knows her Bible, she's read it backwards and forwards. Um, and uh, St. Ambrose, the teacher of St. Augustine, in his own commentary on Luke, suggests, as Origen does, that Mary had studied the prophets, but he makes explicit that she, she, that she had studied the Messianic uh, prophecies specifically. So she already knows, in other words, that she will give birth to the king of kings. She has only to learn that she is that virgin. Um, so here is, uh, oh yes, that's good. Here is Ambrose. Uh, it was Mary's part neither to refuse belief in the angel nor to hastily take unto herself the divine message. How subdued is her answer compared to the words of Zechariah? You know, so Zechariah says, what are you talking about? And is struck with deftness in punishment. Um, but he answers, Zechariah, whereby shall I know this? He refuses to believe that which he says he does not know and seeks, it, as it were, authority for his belief. This is still Ambrose talking. She vows herself willing to do that which she doubts not will be done, which, and how she is anxious to know. Mary had read, behold, she shall conceive and bear a son. She believed, therefore, that it would be, but how it was to take place she had never read. So the idea is that she knows the Messianic prophecies from Isaiah. She knows that a, a virgin is going to give birth to the Messiah. Uh, she doesn't know quite how it's going to happen, 
So the question is that she's asking the angel is specifically about how exactly it's supposed to work. Um, so uh, the painters express this by showing the book that she's reading in certain paintings to be Isaiah 7. So this is um, Tomasio de Messina. Um, and you can see the detail here. It says, Ecce Virgo Concipit. So behold, a, virgo, a virgin shall conceive. So at the very moment when the angel arrives, she's reading the words from Isaiah. Um, likewise, Matthias Grunewald is a similar thing, although she's, she looks more ecstatic. I like her bearing here. Um, but if you zero in on the book that's in front of her, you can see the same thing. It says, behold, a virgin shall conceive. OK, so uh, when we imagine Mary in this way as knowing the prophecies fully beforehand and simply not knowing that she is the person to whom they belong. We see that she knows Christ in some sense before he arrives. So she's learned from reading and study and prayer to know the promises of God, to recognize them as they unfold in fulfillment. So there are um, beautiful instances of this in the Syriac Fathers, and these are a little more surprising, I think. Um, so Ephraim the Syrian again writes in Mary's voice, Isaiah gave your good news of Emmanuel. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and give birth without intercourse. Am I having a dream or a vision that behold on my lap is Emmanuel? So she, you imagine her holding her child, and she sees the child as the fulfillment of the promises which she has read about. So it's be, beyond the bond that a mother would normally have with her son. It's something informed by all of this understanding and study and wisdom that has gone on before it. Uh, there's also, again, a more comic story. There's a dialogue in Syriac between uh, Mary and Joseph. Um, once Joseph discovers she's pregnant, um, and he says the following, he says, you've, you've gone astray like water, chaste girl. Just take the scriptures and read how virgins do not conceive without intercourse, as you are saying. Mary's a tough lady even then. She says, you have gone astray, Joseph. Take and read for yourself. In Isaiah, it's written all about me. How a virgin shall bear fruit. If it's not true, do not accept my word. So they have this argument about her pregnancy, which ends up being based on who has superior knowledge of the scriptures, and Mary wins the argument. So I, I think I like that story because it reminds me of the kind of argument we'd have in my family. Like, who knows what better? Uh, who's, who knows the most? Who's the most bookish? So sometimes uh, the books are not, I, sometimes they are um, Psalters or books of hours. Um, but uh, in the crucial fact that I'm trying to emphasize uh, for the fathers of the church is the virtues of Mary. So in order to be the fitting mother of God, she must be a very high order of human being. She has to be courageous, as is evident on any reading of the Gospels, but also wise and learned, hungry to know the things of God. Um, and so we have also this somewhat, perhaps hyperbolic, description of her in Maximus the Confessor. What was the nature? So she's, by uh, apocryphal um, tradition, uh, dedicated to the temple, Mary, before she is betrothed to Joseph. Um, so uh, she studies in the temple all of this scripture, and here's how Maximus describes her. She loved learning, was an excellent student. She was an expert in every good subject and filled with understanding of the divine scriptures and all wisdom, because she was to become the mother of the word and wisdom of God. She was clever with words, had a pleasant voice. She was blessed by all and was full of all grace. I would say even further that she was worthy of every grace, intelligent with respect to images and words, a scrutinizer of divine images, completely removed from restlessness, wrath, and gossip. Okay, beautiful in soul and body, ordinary in measure of stature, full of every goodness and every good deed. So once again, just to kind of recap since I rambled a little bit, Mary, Mary's wisdom and intelligence matter to the fathers it matters to them that she's learned and well-read and anticipates in her heart and mind already the shapes of God's will for her because of the importance of her consent, her fiat, her being done to me according to thy word. So she's not raped, as are the mothers of the Greek demigods. She chooses her motherhood freely, and despite what must have been terrifying circumstances. So if we imagine Mary as a living being, we must have known that she had plans and interests and concerns, and she's about to get married. She has relationships to her parents, to her village, to its religious elders. And for some reason, it's a, a mysterious fact. It's never mentioned in the Gospels. 
that to conceive a child outside of marriage in this time and place exposes a woman to death or to exile. So the invitation that's being offered to Mary is to an apparently terrible fate. Um, so where does Mary get the strength to consent in this way? How, do we have, how are we able to understand this prospect of a terrible fate, the prospect of stoning or exile or, at best, divorce, as is suggested in the Gospels? Um, why, do, why should we understand that? How should we understand her strength and courage and peace of mind and contemplative understanding? So we can appeal easily, I think. <clears throat> this is an easy trap that believers fall into. To the supernatural character of her faith to miraculous interventions of various kinds. I think the, the passages from the Fathers verge on that at certain points. It sounds like they are praising, giving her every possible good quality. Um, uh, so one pitfall of faith, I'd say, is magical thinking. Um, it becomes like miracles become like alien superpowers in the movies. They can solve any problem. So you're like, well, how could she do that? Well, you know, God can do anything. And I think it can be dangerous to think that way. I mean, there's tr an extraordinary amount of truth in it, but it also can be dangerous because it, it makes us think that somehow everything happens by magic. Um, and if she's a magical creature, if Mary's a magical creature, um, then she cannot be a model for us uh, in the way that both the fathers and the artists who I'm working with today are attempting to depict her. So she is our mother in faith. She's meant to be a model for all believers. And if that's to be the case, thinking of her as being a magical, extraordinary being is not actually particularly helpful. So thinking about her human elements and the human elements on which her wisdom and understanding are built is very important. And I think that's part of the wisdom of the fathers and part of the wisdom of the paintings. So Mary is a model human being, the model for us after Christ, uh, and offered to us in, as a model in some mercy so that a mere human being like Mary, not just a, a God-man like Christ, can mark out a path for us so that we can walk in her footsteps. Um, and as I say, if she's magical, she can't really be a model for us uh, since magic is not in our control. So what is the human basis? And this is what I'll be talking about the rest of the talk, and I'll take it to some other examples. What's the human basis of her consent? Um, the paintings show always... Uh, what St. Ambrose describes in another passage about virgins, her solitude. So she's always sheltered, if we, we can look back if you want, she's always sheltered and enclosed in her study. She's always by herself. Um, there's never anyone else around. There's always these, this is a nice example. Um, she's always walled in. And then if we go back to where we were before, um, this is Cavallini. So here I think it's really made explicit. She's in a room in the city. There's things going on outside. There's neighbors upstairs. There's, I think those are angels coming down the alleyway, but uh, you can imagine that there are other things going on. Uh, it's a city street. But she is to off the street, in, enclosed, separated off, in solitude. Um, so the... Solitude with the book and the studiousness of the solitude was a sign of her independence, her lack of ambition. Okay, she's not out um, glad handing the crowd. Um, her focused absorption um, in the things at hand, and so she's reading the Bible, her focused absorption in things of God. And it's emphasized, I think, at the moment of the appearance because exactly of the high drama of the situation. That is, because the angel's proposal is a challenge comparable only to God's invitation to Abraham to sacrifice his son. So the piece of the images, I think, can hide us from that fact that what we're talking about is a moment of, on the human level, terrible crisis. Uh, and at the divine level, um, this uh, beautiful, peaceful act that changes the course of salvation history. So her inward focus, her love for the words and teaching of the scriptures, enable her to consent regardless of the social consequences of the angel's proposal. So they nurture in her um, a profound trust in goodness beyond any offered by social life. Um, and I think only in retirement, solitude, prayer, study, uh, and the endurance that these might cultivate would it be permitted to make such a 
a radical decision or to build such a radical kind of trust. So the, the inward focus shown by Mary's studiousness is also part of the meaning of uh, the teaching about her perpetual virginity. So she doesn't submit to common purpose that communities establish for women, sexual pleasure, the extension of clans or bloodlines. So her virginity also secures her dignity, um, her standing beyond mere social utility. So this, the social world is a realm of um, suspicion, competition, ambition, using, instrumentalizing, um, dissipation of energy into anxieties and uh, conflicts. So only in withdrawing from it, as Mary is depicted as doing, can the fundamentals of human and divine life really become clear. So this is why I think in these paintings, Mary is always alone um, and her shelter or enclosure or hidden room is always emphasized. The development of her intellect, I think I have a detail on this one actually, let me show it to you. Uh, Crivelli's Annunciation. <coughs> So the development of her intellect takes place in private, in the garden enclosed, as the language from the Song of Songs. It represents the intimate meeting of the word of God and herself. And the word is understood both as a divine invitation um, and also as Christ himself, who she carries in her womb. So um, let me take a few more minutes to just explain uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more, summarize what I just said, and I'm going to take this outside of the Catholic world and explain why I think that what we see here in Mary shows general human features that are important for other kinds of intellectual life. So I've said that we can see Mary um, as an image of intellectual life withdrawn from the world, withdrawn from ambition, withdrawn from social life, to cultivate her inner life. You could imagine a religion, um, and the old fathers might have come up with one, where Mary is a mere bodily vehicle for the divine body of Christ. Right? If all you need is a, a, a God-man, then all you need is a human woman to, to bear the God-child physically. But for them, her inner life was crucial, her consent to the divine plan, but also her possession of the intellectual virtues which inform the consent, thoughtfulness, wisdom, understanding. So in the face of everyday pressures and demands to the contrary, in fact, threats, threats to her life, threats to her safety, she chooses the most important things. So her image is drawn in these paintings and in the Fathers to reflect sort of the highest development of a human being, humanity in its full dignity and splendor. So someone who's an actor at a crucial moment in the history of the world, but at the same time who could be a model for anyone to imitate, anyone. So these virtues are meant to be both very high and very widely available. Uh, and that's part of the importance of uh, Mary and the human elements which put together her, which, out of which her theological virtues are made. So um, let me make, draw some comparisons between Mary and some other uh, images of intellectual life from wildly different contexts to conclude my talk. So, and this is to emphasize my point that it is that her, uh, her virtues have human elements. They are not merely magical. Because if we can find them in other human beings, we can see them as developments of a human nature on which grace operates, um, and not simply as uh, uh, story time, science fiction superpowers. So one story uh, that I like to tell, especially universities, if there are any, are there any grad students here? Okay. Ah, good, very good. So uh, the story of Albert Einstein, um, who was a failure as a graduate student in physics and could not find work teaching or researching as a university. So it's, it's, every grad student should remember that. Albert Einstein could not get a job, um, total failure. So he worked for seven years as a patent clerk and in his spare time, he wrote seminal papers on the photoelectric effect, Brownian, mov Brownian movement, and the theory of special rel relativity. He wrote that all in the patent office. He turned physics upside down during his spare time when he finished his work in a patent office. So he called his patent office 
that worldly cloister where I hatched my most beautiful ideas. So he thought of his patent office as being a place removed from the competitive academic life, removed from the realm of achievements, where he could sit and commune with the orders of nature and understand how things work. Um, so he means by calling the patent office a worldly cloister, that this place of legal business where a normal employee would go to earn a living in exchange for performing some service, but for him it's a place of removal or retreat. It's a cloister. Um, it's a place where the love of learning is put to the test, where ambition is frustrated, where his work has to run on its own power without the grease of seeking out carrots or avoiding sticks. So uh, it's in the quiet of the office that the beauty of the structures of nature take hold of him and display themselves with clarity. So I went a little bit out of order, sorry. So this is another religious image. I, I meant to put that in earlier. This is St. Jerome in the desert. So this is part of the motif of Christian study, isolation, withdrawal, solitude. Um, uh, although it's interestingly different. It's in the desert, right, rather than in an enclosed room. Uh, OK, so here's an image. Uh, these are some pictures, and then I'll, I'll talk through them. Uh, this is uh, yeshiva in Jerusalem, uh, and all those men are studying the Talmud um, for no reason. Uh, it's not an achievement that you just study the Talmud, because that's what you do. Uh, so this is also an image of, although it's uh, social, there's a number of people, there's a teacher. Um, it's uh, an activity that's self-contained, uh, withdrawn, um, without uh, social purpose of any obvious kind. Um, this is an illustration of, uh, it's a little bit out there, but I, I had to include it. Uh, in Plato's Republic, how many of you have read Plato's Republic? Is that something people read? Okay, very good. Okay, about half of you. So in the middle of Plato's Republic, um, Socrates says that uh, the world of politics is so overcome by evils that the philosopher should withdraw behind a little wall um, away from the dust and storm um, and there um, keep his way, keep himself safe uh, and, and think about things withdrawn from the world of politics. So I actually asked someone to illustrate it and they came up with this image. So this, is, this is the philosopher behind the wall. And there are people in flames in the background, which is a little disturbing. But I, I like to use it because people will always ask about it in the question period. Okay. Um, this is an image from uh, a French art film called The Hedgehog. This woman is the character's name, Renee. Uh, she's the concierge of a fancy French apartment building. And this is in her secret reading room, which is hidden in the back. Um, and I think that the resemblance between it and uh, Mary and her study is, is pretty close. But it's a similar theme in the film, that is that this woman has a space away from her diminished working class life as, as, a, as a concierge at an apartment building. Um, and she, uh, this is where her dignity is secured, protected um, from uh, the outside world where she's viewed with contempt and scorn since she's a working class um, sort of servant of the very high end people in the apartment building. Okay, so there's Socrates, and he's not very withdrawn, but he's, there are stories, right? So in uh, Plato's Symposium, uh, he's, he's dressed up for a dinner party, sort of dressed to the nines, all cleaned up. He walks into the door, and he, a thought comes to him. He's just lost in thought in the doorway, completely absorbed. So that's also an example of a type of withdrawal from the world, a type of uh, self-collection, a sense of being... Uh, removed from the world around you, even while in the midst of it. Uh, and this is one of my favorite stories. So this is Archimedes. Uh, this image is called The Death of Archimedes. So Archimedes is an ancient Greek uh, mathematician uh, in Syracuse. Uh, and the story is, this is a story told by the historian Plutarch, uh, that the Romans invaded Syracuse. He had actually helped the Syracusans build all kinds of weapons to fend off the Romans. Um, but then he went off to do his math problems. And he didn't even notice the Romans invading his city. And uh, so at this point, a Roman soldier is coming to, to arrest him. And uh, uh, um, he refuses to go to the Roman uh, officials because he's in the middle of his proof. And so the soldier kills him. This is how he dies. Uh, and later writers give him last words, don't disturb my circles. 
So this is an example of someone, again, where the, where the intellectual life gives you a kind of independence, uh, a sense of being self-contained, a sense of being uh, above the fray, absorbed in something that's uh, transcendent, uh, significant, uh, pregnant with meaning. Um, so uh, I've talked a little vaguely, but I, we have time to talk now if you guys have questions. I've mentioned that I was interested in the human elements of um, Mary's uh, withdrawal into a world of study, uh, her development of virtues of understanding that permit her to um, courageously and peacefully make uh, a decision that involves great risks for her uh, and great promise for the history of humanity. So what are these human elements? Well. Solitude or withdrawal, um, being removed, at least in some part of one's life, from the press of uh, the world. And I emphasize some part of one's life. Okay. One doesn't need to lock oneself into a study for the rest of one's life, but you need to have some space apart from the busyness of the world. Um, so, uh, uh, capacity for solitude, ability to be by oneself. Um, these are associated classically with something called leisure, not the leisure of um, the beach vacation, spring break, Daytona Beach, um, but uh, the leisure of uh, being, uh, doing the human activities which are somehow beyond work. So if you go back to the Paradise Garden early on in the talk. <laughs> which is a nice image to leave with anyway. Uh, this is, I think, beautiful image of leisure, conversation, music, picking fruit, reading. So we need to, all of us, and I, I'm not just talking to young people about this, often uh, we, it's something that we all need to hear from time to time, to carve a space away in one's life uh, where um, study, thinking, peace, prayer, leisure, uh, where wisdom and understanding can grow, uh, and where, from where we can draw the courage and the strength to make difficult decisions. Um, so these are my, this is my attempt to sketch uh, the human preparation for a supernatural desti destiny or the natural goods on which, some of the natural goods on which grace operates. So thank you. I'll now open up for questions. This is written. Was there an actual change in how in Mary's contemplation or how Mary contemplated at that moment? I was wondering if you know there it was a mark in difference for afterwards or if there was a change in the contemplation itself. I don't know if it's um, I think we can imagine it in different ways. I'm not quite sure. I mean, wh what sort of change would you expect exactly? Um, Do you mean at the moment she hears the word or the? Mm -hmm. Yeah, at the moment, if there would be, if that would be a mark of change. Because, you know, you, you described uh, through your talk that she was already learned and dedicated to the temple. Right. So I was wondering if somehow that was already very much in the line of the word that she received or if there was something that had, I, I don't know if I would necessarily call it natural, but uh, maybe a fundamental, there was something more divine inserted in that. Yes, yeah, so, so I think at that moment, you have the operation of grace. So the angel's arrival and the receiving of the word and the conception by the Holy Spirit, um, this is, it is transformative. That's how she becomes the mother of God. Um, so it, I think that is, thank you for asking that, because I think I have to think about it more, and, and I'd be grateful for help from you, uh, theologically informed people, um, or just anyone. Uh, just, I, I can use help from anyone. Um, but that that's part of the point that I'm trying to make about the, in the talk, that uh, there's human forms of preparation, which then have limits. 
you can't make yourself by your human efforts the mother of God. That doesn't make any sense. You can't even make yourself a Christian. You can't even have, develop faith. What you can do is develop habits on which grace can operate when grace, de- when grace decides to operate. So it, it, it's a significant change. I don't know how to characterize it internally, except that um, it's a profound movement in her faith, um, as well as a moment where she becomes a mother. I mean, it's very hard to understand. Wrap your head around it. Go ahead. Um, so I know a lot of them, uh, and I'm working on some old part history knowledge, but okay. a lot of them seem to be from the Italian Renaissance. Yeah. Um, and I knew that you know, at that time, uh, there was a recovery of uh, a lot of Greek texts that had been mi- missing, particularly Plato, um, mm-hmm. from the fall of uh, Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. Um, did you find uh, that these were these paintings had any connection with um, the larger, I guess, intellectual climate of Italy at the time, where sort of bringing in these new ideas of of uh, the Platonic texts, with, which have their own emphasis on, on contemplation and theory. Um, did you find that See, something? See, what I, what I thought was interesting, and I, uh, I am an amateur art historian. I'm trained in philosophy uh, from classics. Wait, sorry. Um, but one of the things that interested me, sorry, I'm looking for the right image, um, is that the images are very old. That's 13th century. That's, uh, I think that's St. Maria de Trastevere. I think that's the, the mosaic. I think that's 12th. That's 11th century. That's in all of the elements, the book, the, the, the um, angel's contact with her ear, the greeting, they're all there. The style of painting is very different. The art is very different. But the themes are not different. Um, so I... Um, there may be subtleties, there may be nuances that develop as the Middle Ages turn into the Renaissance, and someone who knows more about those periods than me could talk about them. But I think what I was struck by was the incredible consistency that you get from early church fathers like Origen and Ambrose, that's like 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century AD, um, and it's picked up by the fathers and held up, and then goes through various literary sources, which I didn't go into in the talk, uh, and uh, surfaces in these paintings. Um, but I, I, think that the, I think that the core of the, of the, of the image is, is there for a long time, um, despite whatever cultural nuances it goes and undergoes. Um, so uh, I, 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 don't know what to, I don't know what to think about that. It, in light of how many other changes were going on. Um, it is definitely, if this is part of your question, it, it's a bit of, it's an intellectualized version of Mary. We're not accustomed to that, I don't think. We're not accustomed to thinking like, oh, well, the most virtuous person would have had to read a lot of books. I and mean, that's just not something we would say, right? um, I don't think. So that might be part of the, ancient philo- philosophical whatever soil yeah, out of which it, it grows. Because it seemed, I mean, right. I was just thinking of that moment in the Renaissance history. And, right. But now I, you, now you remind me, yeah. some of these were way before that. Uh, uh, someone, you know, I was thinking maybe someone could object and say, oh, well, you know, these are just plat- Greek or Hellenistic insertions into right. a previously pure Christianity. <laughs> uh, but it seems that it's Present yeah, if, if it weren't in origin, like origin's about as old as it gets. Like that's second century. Um, now it's not, um, I actually don't want it to be any tighter than that because I want Mary to be a figure of which, to which there is a variety of types of devotion. Um, so I don't, I think if you thought of her, if, if, if she were somehow established definitively as an intellectual, that would shut her off, I think, from people who might not be able to connect with that sort of a person. So I like the fact that people can connect with her as a simple Jewish housewife. Um, I think that's beautiful and important. Uh, but I just, I also, 
uh, just got very interested in this particular strand, which lasted for a long time and has reached roots that go very deep, uh, that she was a learned person.